Welcome to the Midtown Bridge. We're so excited that you are worshiping with us virtually. My name is Tawanda, and we are in week three of the Political Religion series. If you have any prayer requests, please drop them in the chat or the comment box. Now I'm going to turn it over to our worship team. Enjoy.
gonna let you're never gonna let me down you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down you are good and good oh you are good you're good
Well, good morning, and thank you again for tuning in to our broadcast here at the Midtown Bridge Church. My name is Milton, and I have the honor of serving here as lead pastor here at the Midtown Bridge. Thank you for sacrificing your most precious commodity, your time. Well, today we are in week three of our political religion series. See, later on this week, we will likely have the termination of who will be the next president and vice president for the next four years. If we can be honest, many people will be hurt or upset based upon the outcome. Now, I don't have no idea who is going to win the election. And if I'm to be honest, I have found myself uh, engaging in this emotional political tug of war. And perhaps you feel a sense of anxiousness and anxiety as we head into Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. The big idea we've been looking at for this series, Political Religion, is simply this. When the kingdom is bigger, all politics will be bitter. When the kingdom is big, bigger, all politics will be bitter. You see, by now, many of you have voted or you will be voting this Tuesday. And can I tell you this? When you cast your vote, you will be both right and wrong. How is that? How could that be? Well, I know this to be true. There is no one party that fully represents God's kingdom. No candidate truly or fully represents the capital K kingdom of God. However, come Wednesday, our nation will be divided. And unfortunately, so many Christians will be as well. I share that on the onset, the big idea, or better yet, the focus of this series, and any time we open up God's Word here at the Midtown Bridge, is to reset our hearts and eyes upon eternity. We will need this reminder come Wednesday. Today, I call our attention to Romans chapter number 15, verses 5 through 7. And as we examine this passage, I would like to examine it with this thought in mind, civil disagreements, civil disagreements. Let's pray as we prepare our hearts to receive God's word. Father, I pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive the incorruptible seed of your word. Father, help us to hear what you're saying to us individually, but also as your church, as your living epistles, your holy people. And God, help us to respond rightly. God, give me boldness in my utterance to declare the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I beg of you to help me, God. May my words bring glory to you. Lord, I love you and I pray for the individual who's listening. If they don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, would you draw them unto yourself? We love you and we desperately need you. It's in the mighty name of Christ we pray. Amen. Civil disagreements. Romans 15 verse 5 through 7 it says, Now may the God who gives perseverance and endurance grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. The main theme that runs throughout the book of Romans is reconciled. Reconciled. Paul, he writes to these Roman believers whom he had yet to meet in person, letting them know, preparing them, prepping them for his visit. He writes to them, drawing out this main theme that we've been reconciled unto Christ. We've been reconciled unto, unto God through Christ Jesus. Now, the division of Paul's day was a division between Jews and Gentiles. Believe it or not, the, 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 um, the challenges, the frustration, the hatred, that we perhaps sense or experience or feel between uh, political sides of the hour, Republicans and Democrats and independents, it would not hold any type of weight compared to the animosity between the Jews and the Gentiles. 
Paul, he writes this letter reminding them of how desperate they were in need of reconciliation and how God, through Christ, reconciled them back to himself. On top of that, Paul, he writes letting them know about how now the Jews and Gentiles are now a part of the same family. In this particular letter, chapter specifically, Paul is closing out this letter, reminding them of how powerful the blood of Jesus is, how beautiful the gospel message truly is, and how now Jews and Gentiles are now a part of the same family. From this text, I'd like to offer three reminders of how to be civil in and during times of disagreements. The first thing we see in verse five of how we can be civil in disagreements is we must look to please the one who has won our affection. We must look to please the one who has won our affection. Verse five, look at Paul. He says, now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant to you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. Look what Paul says. He says, look, in case you're wondering if you have the ability to do this, he says, God gives perseverance. He says, in other words, you have what you need to live this out. You have what you need to get along. You have what you need to get over it. You have what you need to be reconciled and brought back together. He says, God gives perseverance. But on top of that, not only does he give perseverance, but he also gives encouragement. Paul says you have perseverance, but in case that's not enough, you also have encouragement. We will likely have to remind ourselves of that Tuesday or Wednesday. The reality is both candidates cannot win. One candidate will win and the other candidate will lose. And depending upon where and who you've been praying for and advocating for to assume the mantle of leadership, you will be either excited or disappointed. But yet Paul says, before you start to look at your Christian brothers who caused your candidate to lose, but before you start to, to gloat about your candidate that won, he says, I need you to look to please the one, the only one who truly deserves and is worthy of your affection. And that is not any type of Democrat or Republican, but it's really the audience of one, and that's Jesus. Paul says you have perseverance inside of you because God has given it to you, but also you have this encouragement. Where does that encouragement come from? Christ Jesus. We must remind ourselves as Christians, as Christ followers. He says you need to have this same mind. That sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Remember Philippians, we talks in another way about this same mind. In Philippians chapter number two, Paul says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. He goes on in Philippians chapter number two, verse five, talking about this mind. He says, have this attitude in ourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. Paul says, in case you need a reminder, let me tell you about the mind that, that now you need to be uh, thinking deeply about, that now dwells in you. Fix your mind and bend your mind, bend your heart to have the same mind of Christ. Look at Christ in Philippians, who was God, who wrapped himself in flesh, who submitted to his own creation to the point of death, dying on a cross at the hands of the very ones he created. He says, that is a picture of humility. 
That is a picture of one who loves deeply. You see, if we are going to be civil in our disagreements, we must look to please the one who has won our affection. What I love about that passage in Philippians is it reminds us of the beauty of Jesus that ultimately that should lead our hearts to worship. How about come Wednesday morning, you respond in worship. You, you respond in worshiping the one who still will be ruling and reigning even when politics seems to be going away. You see, one confidence we can have in Christ is we can, we can stand with confidence and assurance knowing that Jesus is not scratching his head, puzzled about who made their way into office. But rather, he is calm and confident knowing that he still rules and reigns in spite of whatever chaos we may feel or experience. If we are going to be civil in our disagreements, we look to please the one who has won our affection. But then Paul, he gives us more hope in verse 5 and verse 6. If we're going to be civil in disagreements, we must look for what we share in common. We must look for what we share in, in common. Picking up at verse 6, he says, So that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's wish was that God would grant the church at Rome and us today a spirit of unity. His desire, he desired that they mind, that they mind the same thing among one another. This literally translates, it does not mean that they should all come to the same conclusion. That is obvious from his discussion of the weak and the strong. The conscience of each is to guide the conduct of that person. But rather, Paul is saying, look, I'm not asking you to all come to the same conclusion, to vote one way, to vote Republican or vote Democrat or Independent. But rather, what he's saying is, despite where you land, what I'm urging you to do is make your allegiance to Christ bigger. He says, I want you to look at what you share in common. In other words, though we may vote differently politically, we are still united spiritually. Don't let our political differences eclipse our spiritual resemblances. Think about it. Think about it. Jesus disciples. In the group there was both Matthew, the tax collector, and Simon, the zealot. Now, historically speaking, there could not be greater chasm or differences between the two. Here you have Matthew, who is a Jew, who's aligned himself with Rome by taxing his own people. And then on the other side, we got Simon, the zealot. The zealots were known for crying out and seeking to overthrow Rome and their powers and authority. And here Jesus invites them into the same crew, the same family. Now, historically, we see no real evidence that Matthew and Simon came to the same conclusion politically of how to deal with Rome. But what we do see is despite of where they landed politically, they still were united spiritually. Despite the earthly powers that should have divided them, they were more committed to eternal authority that bind them together. You see, look for what we share in common. This is what we have in common. We all care about justice. If you are a follower of Christ, it's hardwired now in your DNA, you you care about justice. Anger is a natural and biblical response to injustice. Anger's purpose is to oppose, is to oppose injustice. Now, how we get there can often be different. And the danger sometimes of we're being led by anger is it may lead us into sin. But being angry about injustice is a noble thing. I believe it is actually honoring to God. But the challenge 
And the opportunity is we must learn where to place and how to where, where to place that anger and yet how to control that anger. We must lead anger rather than being led by anger. We all care about justice. That's what we share in common. And that's a good thing. But then also we must acknowledge that we all are sinful. We all are sinful. Grace means that we all struggle with sin. This means that even in our good decisions, we all carry a propensity to be sinful in how we carry them out. In other words, even the good that we do, it might be sinful in how we do it. You see, sin, it corrupted us at the very core of who we are. That's what the gospel declares. Which brings me to my third and final point that Paul gives us in verse 7. Is we must, if we're going to be civil in our disagreements, not only must we, we look to the one who has won our affection, we look to please the one who has won our affection, not only must we look for what we share in common, but verse 7 shows us we must look humbly and hopefully at our sin. We must look humbly and hopefully at our sin. Verse 7, look what Paul says. Therefore, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Paul says, okay, therefore. He, he says, okay, I've said all I've said up to this point to get you back to this point. I've said what I've said about the gospel and how it has brought you into a family, about how you need to keep the mind of Christ. He says, I've said all that so that you might come to this point of what I'm about to say in verse 7. Accept one another. He says, in other words, we have the capacity to accept others no matter how grossly we have been offended because we have been accepted by God, though we have grossly offended him. He says, when you look at how, 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 how much you've offended God against the backdrop of that, it should enable you to be gracious towards others. The gospel says that I'm worse than I think I am. That is the reality of the gospel. That you and I, we're actually worse than we think we are. Yet the gospel also says that God is better than who we think he is. It says we are worse than who we think we are, but yet God is better than we think he is. That is the tension and the beauty of the gospel. Paul said early on in his letter, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul says early in his letter, he says that the, the wages of sin is death. But yet the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. See, the gospel, it reminds us, it humbly reminds us that we are worse than we think we are. But yet it gives us hope because it shows us also that God is better than we think sometimes he is. So as a result, we look humbly and hopefully at our sin. If we're going to be civil in our disagreements, we must look humbly and hopefully at our sin. We must look for what we share in common. We must look to please the one who has won our affection. Can I get really practical about life after the election? There's four practical ways I want to encourage us to respond. See, understand this. Voting is the starting line. Action is the real race. Voting is the starting line, but action is the real race. You see, whoever lands the job of being the president for the next four years, we need to hold them accountable and serve as their moral compass. In other words, we can't get too attached that we only celebrate their right and not call them out when they're wrong. Both sides are deficient on some issues. As Christ followers, we need to roll up our sleeves and figure out how to bring change to our local context. What does it look like for you and your family 
to personally get involved in bringing change. See, I've discovered we're quick to scrutinize politicians, but many of us are asleep at the wheel and not involved with the change we want to see beyond our own family. I believe God wants more from you and I. So understand this voting is the starting line, but action is the real race. And then the second thing I believe an opportunity lies for us beyond Wednesday is run towards the barking dog. Run towards the barking dog. I don't mean that physically for you to run towards the barking dog in your neighborhood, but I'm talking about spiritually and even uh, practically speaking in your interactions with your brothers and sisters in Christ and even those outside of Christ. One of my close friends, he would always say that phrase when it came to managing and dealing with conflict. He used that saying, look, instead of running from it, run towards it. See, it's a lot easier for many of us to just withdraw, to run towards people who see life from the same lens in which we view it, who we share agreement with on similar issues and how we should respond. So if I'm a Republican, I'm gonna hang around with as many Republicans as I can. If I'm Democrat, I'm gonna hang around with as many Democrats as I can. If I'm libertarian or independent, then that's my crowd. But I wanna invite us with an opportunity, especially for those of us at part of the Midtown Bridge to run towards the barking dog. If you see that brother or sister yelling on social media about an issue, instead of just calling them out, why don't you invite them to a meeting or a hangout? and have a dialogue about your differences and those things you also share in common. One of the challenges in which we, ways we're showing biblically how to do that is found in James chapter number one, verse 19 through 20. Well, James says, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. James says, look, when you engage that brother or sister, instead of you yelling at them, why don't you try listening? Why don't you try trying to hear the framework of their pain and even how they landed on their view? And then you share civil, civil, in a civil way, why you disagree and maybe giving them another perspective on that very issue. James says, look, don't be so quick to get angry, but give grace. Seek to understand Seek to, before you're trying to be understood, run toward the barking dog. But then the third thing is disrupt the herd. Disrupt the herd. You see, staying on one side of a political aisle is not going to solve these moral issues that our country is facing. You see, Democrats don't have all the answers, neither do Republicans, but it's only when they still all come together for the sake of the moral fabric of our country, for those of us who are Christians. You see, we must learn to disrupt the herd, come out of our comfort zones, have dialogue about those things that the enemy oftentimes is using to divide us. And then the last thing, which I believe oftentimes we as Christ followers are quite anemic, is we need to learn to pray fervently. Pray fervently. Pray for those you disagree with. I found this to be true. When you pray about the outcome of someone else's faith, God often deepens your affection for them. You see, I can't change the heart of President Trump or Vice President Biden, but God can. My confidence is in Proverbs 21 verse 1, which says, The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. In other words, God, he holds the whole world in his hand and every ruler and leader. He holds their very heart in his hand. He turns it in the way he best knows is going to lead us towards his predetermined end for humanity. And so one of the things we must learn to do is join God in praying fervently for our leaders praying for our brothers and sisters who view life and politics different from us. Because it's in that that God has this unique way of cultivating a love for our heart, not just for the outcome, 
but for the person on the other side of the aisle. Pray fervently. Jesus, Paul, and the rest of the apostles, they could have spent a lot of time talking about Caesar and the political world of their day. Yet they had very few things to say about it. They said a few things, but very few. Why is that? You see, a true artist does not produce his or her best work with dry erase markers. But he or she, they, uses, they use more permanent paint or ink. Why is that? Because they want their work to remain. Jesus, Paul, the apostles, the saints through the ages did not spend much of their time talking about politics. Why? Because they too were focused on a more permanent kingdom. As Christ followers, we know with confidence that come Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or to Jesus calls us home, we have an assurance and a confidence that he will win. His kingdom it does not hang in the balance on Tuesday, but his kingdom will one day be ushered in, no matter who's in office. And so I want to encourage us, though you may face Tuesday or Wednesday with anxiety, fear, and other types of trepidation, I want to encourage you to stand firm and confident knowing that your king will still be ruling, will still be reigning, even after this election and whatever elections there are to come in the days and years to come. So as Christ follow us, we can have, be civil even about our disagreements, the disagreements because though we may vote different politically, we're still bound together by who we are in Christ spiritually. Let's pray. Father, I pray, God, that you would not only give us ears to hear, but hearts to really hold on to this word. Father, Tuesday and Wednesday is coming. And God, we don't know what awaits. We don't know, God, how divided our country will be. Father, we don't even know emotionally exactly how we're going to feel. But Father, I pray that you will help us to drag our souls to the altar. That you will remind us of the truth of this word. And Father, we've been wonderfully and marvelously accepted by Christ. And there is more that we share in common because of Jesus than what se separates us. And so, Father, I pray that that reality will grip our hearts and steady our souls come Wednesday. Father, I pray for the man, woman, boy, or girl who's listening. And perhaps for the first time, the gospel is making sense. Father, would you draw them unto yourself? Give them courage to yield to the authority of Jesus the Christ. May they place their confidence in his finished work on the cross. We love you and we trust you. It's in the mighty name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, hey, perhaps today the gospel made sense to you for the first time. Would you email us at info at the Midtown Bridge? We'd love to set up a time to meet with you via coffee or maybe just online in Zoom in the midst of the fact that we're in the midst of a pandemic. But we'd love to hear how you sense Jesus Christ working in your life. And we'd love to share how we know he's been so transforming to our very lives. And the same transformation he's brought to our life, we are confident he can do in yours. So again, thanks for tuning in. Pray and trust you were encouraged by God's word. And now I'm going to turn over to the capable hands of our worship team to lead us in song. And then I'll be back with you with a few announcements about how you can plug in deeper here at the Midtown Bridge. God bless you.
Thank you again for tuning in to this broadcast. I pray and hope that you were greatly encouraged by God's word. Um, so again, thanks again, Midtown Bridge, for being such a faithful church. Uh, this week, we had an opportunity to make an, um, at least a spiritual investment in the Youth of Hope to Africa. Uh, they actually had, they led their own camp this week in South Africa, and uh, I was able to share with them a couple of devotions and so thank you because of your generosity here at the Midtown Bridge. We're able to financially support that ministry uh, throughout the year. And so, hey, if you love to like to learn more about that ministry, uh, man, just go to our website. You can learn more about Hope to Africa and uh, just the, the amazing work God is doing uh, through those young people to, to literally reach and turn their community upside down for the glory of God. And so thank you for your generosity and allowing us to be able to support that ministry of Hope to Africa. As I share in the message, um, today I want to invite you all to join us right after this broadcast at 11 o'clock via Zoom uh, for our Unity Forum. That is a great opportunity we're going to use to just connect and unify our hearts around this whole idea of politics and just talk through, have a real honest discussion about some of our fears and anxiety uh, uh, just being caused by this political climate we're in. Uh, I want us to be unified, not around politics, but around Jesus. And so please join us today. You can just go to our website and click on that orange button that says Unity Forum, and it'll take you right into that Zoom meeting um, as we prepare to discuss and even spend some time praying that God might knit our hearts together uh, beyond what's going to take place on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. So please join us for that. Bring your questions. And we just want to have a real honest discussion and time of prayer. Um, as we prepare for uh, what's going to happen this coming Tuesday and Wednesday. All right. We know that we are bound together by who we are in Christ, not by who's in office. And so join us for that Zoom, uh, that unity forum today. 
Uh, last but not least, I uh, want to invite you all uh, to connect to a community group. That's just a great way to stay connected to what God is doing here at the Midtown Bridge, but also to be connected to one another in light of this season of uh, social distancing we're experiencing right here in our country. Thank you all again for tuning in. Let me pray over us as we are prayer benediction, and hopefully I'll see many of you all at the Unity Forum in a few minutes. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what our, ears, our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and what our hearts have felt. And God, I pray that you will steady us this week. Help us, God, to fix our eyes upon Jesus. God, we pray for this election. We pray, uh, God, for the candidates, and we pray already for whoever will be our leader our Commander-in-Chief, that you, God, will just do a work in their life that we could not even have imagined um, um, even right now as we head into this, this voting, this election, uh, closing out this election season. Would you, God, um, just do a miraculous work? We trust you and we believe and we know that you are sovereign and you are ruling over it all. So God, where well, we've made politics an idol, would you help us, God, to reset our hearts and our affection back towards you? It's in the mighty name of Christ we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks again for tuning in and make it a great week.